Dr. Sherry Tenpenny is an osteopathic physician from Cleveland, Ohio. Her team of physicians and acupuncturists at Osteomed 2 focus on four specialized areas, including biomedical treatment of autistic and vaccine-injured children. As president of the board of directors for the Washington, D.C.-based nonprofit, the American Association for Health Freedom, Dr. Tenpenny is an outspoken advocate for free choice in health care, including the right to refuse vaccination. Let's get a warm IOMT welcome for Dr. Tenpenny. It's interesting how to come to this meeting, and I'm very honored to be here. Um, I've been doing integrative medicine since 1994 when my business partner and colleague, Dr. Dave Fronsack, died of cancer at the age of 32. And when Dave died, I said, well, gee, I needed to get back to my osteopathic roots and do more preventive and holistic medicine and not just patch people up in the ER, for which I'm board certified in emergency medicine, and I did that for about 12 years. Interestingly enough, the first conference that I attended was one by Dr. Dietrich Klinghart about oral dental things. And it was the very first introduction into integrative medicine that I did, which I've subsequently been told and found out that was quite a, a dive into the deep end of the pool. <laughs> And what I found from that meeting was that I, my first thought was that dentists really hold the keys to, the, to a healthy body literally in their hands. And most of their training is just about digging holes and filling them with toxic waste. So it's so neat to be here with a group of people that kind of understand that and know that there are other ways to health and be present in this group. I feel like I've sort of come full circle to the initiation of what my, uh, what my first um, introduction into integrative medicine was. So I was asked to speak on the topic that I, I present frequently about iodine. And I've, there's, there's several other topics that I talk on quite frequently that many of you may know. But this is one that I, that I do a lot for the, men, for the medical associations, uh, whether it be AAM or ACAM, about iodine and the underutilized element that this is in our health. So just to give a backdrop just of where the halogens live on the, uh, on the periodic table of, of elements, you can see that there's fluorine and chlorine and bromine and then this great big molecule of iodine that's here. And just for relationship, that's where the mercury molecule sits on the, on the periodic table. So as this one is missing, you can absorb all of these much smaller ones into the body, and that's some of the things that we're going to talk about. In 1990, the World Health Organization estimated that 28.9% or almost a third of the global population of the world is iodine deficient, that 11.2 million had overt cretinism, and 43 million had mental impairment due to lack of iodine. Many of those are in third world countries in, in endemic sort of areas. Therefore, iodine deficiency diseases is the leading cause of preventable mental retardation in the world, which I think is really quite profound. We don't have it so much here, and we're going to talk a little bit about why that is, but that there still are some borderline problems that are not assessed from a, from a full evaluation. I got really interested in this whole topic of iodine probably in 2004 when I read this paper by Dr. Jack Kessler, who's from Symbolon. He's a, a company that's in Boston. And this was a, a paper called The Effect of Superphysiological Levels of Iodine on Patients with Cyclic Mastalgia. And when I explain that to patients, I always say, you know, of course a man would come up with that title, right? <laughs> because what does that really mean? My breasts hurt around my periods. And it was published in the Breast Journal, and it was a very, very well-written paper and documented the fact that iodine deficiency was so impactful on the health of breast tissue. I subsequently went down the entire pathway of looking at all the associations between iodine, breast disorders, iodine and thyroid disorders, and the associated link between low iodine, low, or low thyroid, fibrocystic breast disease, and other disorders of the breast, and that the missing link was iodine. I subsequently pull, pulled over 400 papers from the conventional medical literature that date back as far as 1976, that these associations have been known and e either overlooked or, or, or ignored or simply not talked about very much. And after I read that paper, I stumbled across this that was put out by the National Cancer Institute that said that the incidence of breast cancer increases with age. And that as, you, as we get older, that uh, the lifetime risk of developing breast cancer is one in eight women. This was put out in 2002, and since that time, I've read many more re, uh, papers that are talking about the incidence of breast cancer becoming maybe one in four, in some places even one in three. It's like, what's the underlying cause of that? Is it just that people have bad luck, or is there something that might be missing? And that despite nearly 100 years of iodinized salt, iodine deficiency still exists in the U.S. 
Because usually when I start talking about this talk, that's the first thing that comes up. Well, we use iodine in our salt, and so doesn't that really take care of it? It really doesn't, and, that, and let me show you why. That when the first NHANES study, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, took place between 1971 and 1974, it found that 2.6% of U.S. citizens were iodine deficient. That was back in the 70s. When they repeated that study, when the NHANES 3 came out, was conducted between 1988 and 1994, it found that 11.7% of all citizens were iodine deficient. Now that's a pretty big increase when you consider a, a global population in this country of, what, about 300 million people now? We're getting close to that number. I mean, that's a large percentage of our population that is overtly iodine deficient. And this doesn't even take into consideration the people who are, have low iodine or just mildly deficient iodine and the sort of syndromes that they might get with that. These are overt iodine deficiencies. So why is iodine deficiency increasing? If we have iodine salt, where else do we get iodine that we may not be consuming it anymore and may be contributing to the deficiency? Well, we cut down on our salt consumption, whether it be iodinized salt or non-iodinized salt, because of all the things about high blood pressure. We shouldn't be taking in salt. It's really the sodium that we're concerned about, but we take out all of the salt because of, of the fears and the concerns about hypertension. There's, eggs are a good source of, of iodine, and we decrease egg consumption because we're so concerned about cholesterol, and I think that eggs get a really bad rap. I mean, they're a wonderful food, they're a wonderful whole food, and that I do believe that, 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 that eggs have gotten a really bad rap in terms of elevating cholesterol because there are a lot of other things that elevate cholesterol, not just eggs. We don't eat fish anymore, and that's another good source of iodine because we're so concerned about mercury and the mercury toxicities in all the different fish. We don't really have access to, and I don't think anybody in this crowd really has a great big um, appetite and a big serving of seaweed and kelp at dinner time on their plates. And so we don't have a lot of sea vegetables. And I personally think that a lot of the iodine, or a lot of the low breast cancer incidence reporting that comes out of Japan, that the Japanese, the Taiwanese, and some of the Chinese having the lowest levels of breast cancer in the world, I really don't think, I personally don't think that that has a lot to do with the amount of soy that they take in, which is what we've been told. I really think it has a lot to do with how much iodine they take in because they have a, a large um, appetite and diet with a, a lot of sea vegetables and sea animals. They're living on an island, particularly in Japan, where the salt from the ocean, particularly the iodine because it's actually a gas, falls onto their soils. They have higher uh, concentrations of iodine in their soil. And so the women there have a much higher level of iodine endemically, and that's actually been shown in some of the research studies. And that when those women in Japan move to the United States, and we see that their increase of breast cancer goes up, I think that a lot of that has to do with what we're talking about here, that their iodine um, consumption goes way down. And then we've got very de a, soil de a lot of soil depletion here in the United States, and that minerals are decreased by accelerated deforestation and soil erosion. Food grown in iodine deficiency regions are, do not provide enough iodine for people and livestock living in that area. And there's an acute iodine deficiencies in the soils around the globe, and particularly around the Great Lakes Basin. And for those of you that grew up around that area, you know back in the 20s they actually called that the goiter belt because the, the soils are so depleted. And I, you know, we do now get uh, vegetables and fruits that shipped in from all parts of the country, but things in that area are still really quite depleted. There was a study that was done back in the, in the early 80s and I apologize, I don't remember who it was that did this, but they laid a map of the iodine deficiency around the Great Lakes area, and they put a, a simultaneously um, superimposed a map of the, of, the, of the incidence of breast cancer in those areas, and there was a huge overlap. And you'll see as we go through this a little bit more, the relationship between iodine and breast health. So how much iodine do we really need? I mean, that's really been a, a, a discussion that I think needs to be brought into the forefront with more research that hasn't really been completed for all these years, and I'm going to show you that. We have, I, there's this a short history of iodine sufficiency, not deficiency, but this is a short history of how much iodine do we really need. Iodine deficiency as a risk factor for goiter has been known since at least 1820, and in 1916, Dr. David Marine conducted trials in Akron, Ohio, which is he looked at two groups, and I believe there were somewhere between 800 and 1,200 girls in each one of the groups. And in one group, they were treated with potassium iodide. The other group was non-treated, and they followed them for, se for uh, several years. In the treated group that had the potassium iodine, only two of those girls had developed goiters. And in the control group, 250 had developed goiters. 
So from that study, back in 1916, they decided that the best way to get iodine into the diet was through iodinized salt. And in 1924, iodinized salt began to be used in the U.S., and it was first used in Michigan. Several years later, after 1924, when they started using iodinized salt, there was an epidemiological study that concluded that if less than 5% of a given population used iodinized salt, uh, and, they, and that, less than 5% of that population developed a goiter, the amount of iodine was sufficient for the body. And it was just left at that from the early 1930s. It really hasn't gone on from there. Since that time, the only impact of iodine that anybody ever talks about or discusses is iodine and the thyroid. And it's been determined that the thyroid needs about 150 micrograms per day for adequate functioning. And that's all that's ever talked about. If you talk to an endocrinologist, I mean, that's what they say. You know, well, iodine, thyroid, iodine, thyroid. They forget that the iodine is necessary for many other parts in the rest of the body. And, this, and the other thing that's really important about that study is this was overt iodine deficiency is all that was considered. The impact of mild to moderate iodine deficiency was not a consideration then or now. And to date, the RDA for total body iodine load has never been determined. Even though the, the, um, the iodine is important for many other tissues in the body that I'll show you in a minute, there's never really been any, any studies that have been done to develop and determine what the, RD, the total RDA requirement is for the body. So how does iodine get into the tissues? I mean, it can, I mean, is it just a passive diffusion? I mean, how do we get it in there? Well, on the surface of the thyroid, there is this uh, glycoprotein called the sodium iodine symporter, or NIS for short. And what that does is it helps, is it imports the iodine, or the iodine that's in the circulation or something that we've eaten into the thyroid and then makes our thyroid hormone from there. Interestingly enough, the NIS, or the symporter, has been found on many different tissues in the body, disproving the previously held view that it is a thyroid-specific protein. And, the, and it's what the NIS does is pumps the iodine into the other cells of the body. And this came from an endocrin, endocrinology review that is very thorough. Um, so for the rest of the body, the NIS, or the symporter, mediates active iodine transport into the following tissues pancreas, liver, and the mucosa of gastric uh, lining, the uh, small intestine and the large intestine, the nasopharynx, lacrimal glands, choroid plexus, the ciliary body for dry eyes, skin, mammary glands, and salivary glands. And I wanted to make, put a yellow highlight up there because this is a dental conference and to show you that iodine is really important for saliva. And when I hear patients that come in a lot and they talk about that sicka syndrome, the dry eyes, dry mouth, all those things, I really look really hard for an iodine deficiency. The two things that I found that works really well for that in women is I look for an iodine deficiency and most of the time that I, I, I find it. And when they've got, the, got dry eyes or, or very dry mouth, they need to have some iodine. The other thing that works really well is a little progesterone cream. And if women are already using a progesterone cream and they have a little bit, just a little bit that's left over on their fingers, and they put it around very lightly underneath their eyes on that very thin skin that's right underneath their, their eyes, just that little bit of progesterone brings in some, some moisture into those tissues, and that can help a lot with dry eyes. So these are some of the other organs in the body that are required to have iodine, but we don't even know how much, because all we know is the 150 micrograms for the thyroid. Now, in addition to iodine, and this is something that I've come across when I was doing, putting together some research for, for this particular talk and some other things that I've been working on, is that I've started thinking of selenium and iodine as sister molecules. I don't give one without the other. I really think that they're really, really important for a lot of reasons. Um, selenium deficiency may have a profound effect on thyroid hormone metabolism and possibly on the thyroid gland itself. There is an S, selenium-dependent enzyme called type 1 deiodinase. It's a selenium-dependent enzyme that plays a major role in converting that T4 to T3 in the, in, the, in the periphery. So TSH goes down and stimulates your thyroid hormone, or your thyroid, to make T4. T4 floats around out there in the bloodstream and it ends up going into the cells. It's activated at that level by a selenium-dependent enzyme, and it's the T3 that is what drives your engine. So without the selenium, that doesn't happen very well. When you, have, when you see a patient and you decide that they may be selenium deficient for a variety of reasons, maybe you've ordered a blood test, um, sometimes we think of selenium as being a big anti-cancer, antioxidant sort of mineral, and so we add selenium in. And if you're adding selenium only in and you're not aware of whether or not the patient is iodine deficient, these are some things that can happen. 
that enzyme increases in the cells and starts transporting more T3 into the cell, which drops T4 in the bloodstream, which conventional doctors or those that aren't aware of this will start thinking that the selenium is making that person be more hypothyroid, and it's really not. It's just a physiological response. If the patient, in addition to being selenium depleted, and you're putting the selenium in, if they're also iodine depleted, there won't be any iodine to go through that, that process with the symporter to replace the T4. So the T4 drops, and everybody thinks the patient is becoming hypothyroid, and they're really just is selenium and iodine deficient. The TSH will go up because it's trying to capture whatever iodine happens to be floating around out there. So we'll see this combination of low T4 and elevated TSH, which by definition, we often think of that as hypothyroidism. But if you take a step back from that, really what they are is selenium and iodine deficient in the large percentage of the patients. So when you see these two things together, and this came from the Journal of Endocrinology in 1997, so this information's been around for a while, that prolonged defi selenium deficiency coupled with iodine deficiency may lead to tissue hypothyroidism and impaired brain function. That's really important stuff. Are those two substances going together? Iodine is the halogen and iodine is the mineral and how important they are for all other areas of the body. So the reason for that is, we already talked about it a little bit, but I'm gonna take it one step further. One of the things that selenium does is the selenium deficiency lowers the concentration of glutathione peroxidase in the thyroid. You need the selenium there for the glutathione peroxidase. Glutathione peroxidase detoxifies the thyroid gland. In the process of all those steps of making thyroid hormone, one of the byproducts of that is hydrogen peroxide. That's just as one of the byproducts of it. What selenium does, it acts like a little sponge and, and takes away that hydrogen peroxide. So when a person is also iodine deficient in that accumulation of, of, of hydrogen peroxide without the selenium, it causes the thyroid cells to die and you subsequently get low thyroid or hypothyroidism. The other thing that you get is that Hashimoto's, that back and forth and back and forth, sometimes high, sometimes low, sometimes high, sometimes low. And you hear patients who have all the sluggish sort of stuff of hypothyroidism, which is cold hands, cold feet, dry skin, hair falling out, cold, constipation, inability to lose weight. They, go, they switch from that to the, I'm feeling really anxious and really hyper and, and I can't sleep at night and, and you know, I'm I've, I've just really, really, really feeling anxious. That swinging back and forth is very indicative of Hashimoto's. So here's a real pearl to kind of think about. Even mild selenium deficiency can contribute to the, to the development of autoimmune diseases in the thyroid. And there are many articles in the conventional medical literature, this is just one of them that was recently published in 2006, talking about selenium and thyroiditis in the Journal of Endocrinology, saying that those two things are really, really connected. And if you do have a patient that has um, um, Hashimoto's, there's a whole lot of other things to think about, including um, mercury toxicity to the thyroid, that's one of the things that can happen. You've got this mercury stuff here that just sort of falls down into the thyroid through your lymphatics. So you can have a mercury issue in the thyroid, you can have a low selenium level with the thyroid, and you can have a low iodine level with the thyroid. All those things kind of all couple together. There have been many reports in the conventional literature that says that just by adding selenium, that 40% of patients with, hypo, with Hashimoto's disease will recover. Their, their, uh, their antibodies will go away and they will recover just from selenium. So we've talked about a lot of the things that the selenium does. So what's the relationship between low iodine and breast pathology? Because this is a real passion of mine. We do a lot of breast thermography in our office, and we have an entire program that we're put, they've, we've put into place. And I so appreciated the first presenter this morning talking about the dental amalgam connection with the breast pathologies. I, I, that was really great. And we're going to be using more of the porphyrin tests and looking at that too and, and when we see patients that come back with abnormal thermograms. So what is the, the connection here? Well, this goes back to at least 1967, and the reports that came out of JAMA in 1967 that said an iodine deficiency in rats causes tissue hyperplasia and atypia in the mammary tissue. So this is stuff that's been around for a long time, that they see that when, when the tissues start to, to lose their, their substrates to keep them healthy, they start to degrade and break down. And I know that for myself, because I'm an osteopathic physician, you know, osteopathy, one of the tenets and the basic principles of osteopathic medicine is that the body has the ability to heal and repair itself when you put the missing biochemistry, the missing, a physio put the biochemistry back in. 
So we look at biochemistry first because all those biochemistry things are what are necessary to run your physiology. And if you have adequate biochemistry, good physiology, that peels off into that you need good structure function relationships. And osteopathic principles are about structure function relationships like many of the chiropractors are. Our school, and I explain this to patients by saying if you've got a door hanging on crooked and a door jam, it's, the phys, it's not going to work very well. So you've got a, you have a structure function relationship. When the door's crooked, it won't swing very well. You straighten out the structure, and that function of the door can work really much better. So you've got structure-function relationships. So instead of just saying, well, gee, the body just sort of like breaks down and deteriorates, and that's just what happens when you get old, you know, we really want to look at those underlying biochemistry, physiology, and anatomy associations. And this one's been around since 1960s. And I'm going to show you a few more of those. And this is one that kind of breaks my heart. When you think about those connections of all of those women, at least one in eight, possibly going higher, that could have had these sort of things, elements, added back into their, their system to make them healthier. Maybe those statistics wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be so bad. In 1976, epidemiological data suggests that the relationship between regions of known endemic goiter, known to be related to low iodine, increased breast disease. And that was in the Lancet in 1967, and cancer causes control in 2000. So those are you know, a little bit more recent things. In 79, it was shown that estradiol-treated rats leads to pathological changes in the breast tissue, including cystic changes, periductal fibrosis, and lobular hyperplasia. And those are in, in rats in, who were iodine deficient when you put more estrogen in there, and whether the estrogen is birth control pills, um, HRT, bioidentical hormones, xenoestrogens from the env environment, when there's low iodine there, it increases breast pathology, just by definition. This has been around for a long time. Then Gent and Eskin did their studies uh, between 1975 and 1989 and showed that more than 1,300 patients with a variety of breast pathology and observed that iodine led to an improvement rate of 40 to 70 percent of the subjective pain problems and the objective fibrosis symptoms over, over that period of time. That's huge. And it's something that should be common knowledge and not something that I got to dig out of old medical journals somewhere. I mean, this is something that we should be knowing and should be using. There was studies that were in 95, 96, and 97 that showed the histiological changes can be reversed in the breast tissue with introduction of iodine. Rat studies demonstrated that iodine suppresses the formation of breast tumors. And then this one is really important, that iodine absorption and organification occurs in the same ductal epithelium where the majority of breast cancers occur. If that's being absorbed in the same place and that's deficient, and whatever else is causing those tissues to break down, environmental chemicals, mercury, lead, arsenic. I mean, there was a paper that came out just recently that showed that what, there's 200, more than 200 known chemicals that are in breast milk nowadays that they've determined. More than 200 chemicals are laden into the breast. So the breast is fat tissue. It's hydrophilic. It's going to accumulate all of those things. So if you've got a deficiency of iodine in those tissues, the, the risk of those chemicals and heavy metals causing damage goes up exponentially. So how much iodine is needed to have healthy breasts? We keep talking about 150 micrograms for a healthy thyroid. What about healthy breasts? Well, breast tissue is actually like a sponge for iodine, and studies have shown that a minimum amount of iodine to protect the breast from fibrocystic disease and cancer is 20 to 40 times more than needed to prevent a goiter. In other words, the breast needs, some, instead of 150 micrograms, it needs somewhere between 3,000 and 4,000 micrograms a day for healthy breasts. <coughs> That came from an article from 1993. So again, this is information that's been around for a while. And there's no RDA for the body. We need to figure that out. <laughs> Iodine and diseased breast tissue, the incidence of fibrocystic changes among women is reported now to be more than 60% of women have fibrocystic disease in, in their breasts. And we define that either by lumpy breasts, dense breasts, tender breasts around your period, or actual cystic changes that, you can actually, that can actually be seen on ultrasound. About 5% of those are considered to be risk factors for developing breast cancer, and that these changes respond and reverse in the presence of 3 to 6 milligrams, or 3,000 to 6,000 micrograms a day, taken for 3 to 4 months. And that was from Dr. Kessler's original paper that caught my attention and, said, and taught me, did, uh, led me down this path to do more research in this area. It's like, wow, in three to four months we can reverse all that and reverse all those things that I just showed you? That is astonishing. People need to know about this. So what about iodine in the salivary glands? 
Well, we found that there's a symporter on the thyroid. It's also been found in salivary glands. Iodine concentration in salivary glands can reach 20, 30 to 40 times that's seen in plasma. Um, fluoride and bromide inhibit transport of, of, of the iodine into the saliva, and thiocyanate inhibits iodine transport and utilization in the salivary glands. Thiocyanate most commonly in most of the patients you're going to see uh, probably is gonna, mostly going to come from cigarette smoke. So it's really about the cigarette smoking where they get exposed to that and it inhibits iodine going into the gland and I think contributes to a lot of the dry mouth syndromes. So what about concerns about excess iodine? You know, we've, we're always so afraid that we might go above that 150 micrograms. Well, we've shown that at least in the breast tissue, we need three to 4,000 micrograms. What about that? And if you ask any endocrinologist, they, get, they say, well, there's this whole thing about, this, about, about excess high iodine that came from 1948 with this wolf chaikoff report. And they keep talking about the wolf chaikoff syndrome. I don't know if any of you heard of that, heard that before. What they really, what that's, there was a, a, a research pu publication that all is, like conventional medicine hangs their hat on this and says that the wolf chaikoff syndrome, if you take too much iodine in, it'll shut down the thyroid, and if you shut down the thyroid, then you'll end up with more problems than you started. Well, that was what, that, it was, that was what the, this report came from 1948, that they said this critical high threshold was known as the wolf chaikoff effect. E increased iodine will shut down the patient, make them be hypothyroid, and you'll cause all kinds of problems. The part that, that we all kind of missed, all of us doctor types kind of missed, was that the very next year, <laughs> they came out with another study that said that the maximum of, uh, duration of that inhibitory effect of iodine was about 50 hours. So in a two-day period of time, there's a self-mechanism, that escape mechanism that starts, and the, and the thyroid takes off and starts running again on its own. Gee, we missed that. <laughs> because, and because we missed that, so many patients are running around out there with hypothyroid system, symptoms um, and because they're low, thi low, low iodine. You know, I'm really a big advocate about activism. I mean, that's why I'm involved with the American Association for Health Freedom and all the different stuff that I've done. And I just think that everybody needs to get active. <laughs> just everybody needs, you need to pick something you're passionate about, whether it's the mercury filling issue, whether it's vaccines, whether it's the environment, whether it's animal rights. I mean, whatever it is, get, get, get really involved with it. And what can you do about it? Find an organization and get involved. Get involved because these really are life and death issues and these mandatory things that are happening to our environment are really upon us and we need everybody to get active. Right now we still have a right to choose. We may not always because what Paul, Ron Paul said, go Ron Paul. <laughs> when we give government the power to make medical decisions for us, we in essence accept the state owns our body. And he said that a long time ago, and I think that we need to be vigilant about that. A lot of you guys have talked about state medical boards and things like that. Get out, get active, get involved, find an organization you can be, you can be part of. And with that, thank you.